Hey guys, Dr. Rich Saplita here. I want to talk to you today about Dawkins, Squirrels, and the Cross. Dawkins, as in Richard Dawkins, the world's leading atheist. He's an evolutionary biologist. Squirrels, you guys know what squirrels are, those little gray things that dart around all over the place, run out in front of your car, right? And the cross, as in the cross of Jesus Christ, of course, this weekend coming up is, uh, we have Good Friday and Easter Sunday, so it's the perfect time to talk about uh, Dawkins, squirrels, and the cross. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about evolution, which is a little strange because, as most of you know, I'm no longer an evolutionist. I used to be, but I no longer hold to the Darwinian view of evolution. But I certainly did back in 2010 when I was still teaching at the University of Georgia. And every semester, one of the classes that I taught had a special unit on evolutionary psychology. Okay, and so as we were exploring evolutionary psychology, we came across Richard Dawkins' uh, theory called the selfish gene theory. And it's a very interesting theory. I think you'll find it fascinating because the point of selfish gene theory is to help us understand things like selfless behavior. So it's kind of a weird name, selfish gene, but it's going to help us understand better, uh, that's the point of it, why people uh, will sometimes act in a very unselfish and self-sacrificial way. So let me give you a little bit more background here. This is a huge challenge, the challenge of self-sacrifice, the challenge of what evolutionists call altruism and what the rest of us call love, okay, true love, sacrificial love. This is a big challenge for the evolutionary camp. You know, it makes sense why an animal would act in its own best interests, right? Um, why an animal would pursue food, would fight off other animals for food, why it would act to protect itself. But what about when an animal, or even more significantly, when a human acts in a self-sacrificial way? How does the evolutionist explain that? And that's what Richard Dawkins, from an atheistic and evolutionary perspective, set out to explain. Okay, so um, again, we don't need much of an explanation for when people or animals act in their own best interests, but what about those very fascinating cases when they're acting in the best interests of someone else, of another, and that's a, that poses a significant cost to that individual? All right, so here's where things get very interesting. So we're gonna start out with squirrels, okay? So we got Dawkins covered so far. Now we're gonna to get to squirrels. And uh, I, got, I got figure A here, appropriately labeled A. And what you'll notice about my figure A is you have two squirrels. You have a squirrel on the top, which is the recipient squirrel, and a squirrel here on the left, uh, who is labeled as the donor squirrel. And so this is the actor or donor squirrel uh, this is the squirrel that is being acted upon. And you'll notice there are four boxes there. This is a theory in psychology called social exchange theory. And according to social exchange theory, you can either have zero sum interactions. So altruism and selfishness are our zero sum interactions. You could have negative sum interactions, which is spite and then positive sum interactions, which is cooperation. Okay, so for example, if two squirrels go foraging together and they help each other, then that would be an act of cooperation. Squirrel A gives to squirrel B, squirrel B gives something back to squirrel A, and they're both better off for it, okay? That doesn't need a lot of explanation because both squirrels benefit from that. Now, sometimes animals, and especially people, will act in a spiteful way. We call this a negative sum interaction. And so, um, like if, if squirrel A decides to attack squirrel B, right, knowing that he's likely to get injured in the process, but harming this other squirrel is so important to him that he goes ahead and he does it anyway, that is a negative sum interaction. That's spite. Spite is whenever I presumably hate somebody so much that I'm willing to even incur a cost to myself even harm myself in some way, as long as I can damage that person, okay? So let's go and look at the, the zero sum interactions. Uh, selfishness, you don't need to look far in our society, do you? Uh, to see plenty of examples of selfish behavior. This is something we all struggle with. 
Hopefully, as Christians, uh, Christ sanctifies us away from that. But selfishness occurs, let's say, when squirrel A here steals a nut off of squirrel B. So he's better off for it. It's a plus sign for him, but it's a minus sign for this poor squirrel up here because he just got that nut stolen. He doesn't have it anymore. And so that, the plus and the negative, balance each other out. They cancel each other out. So we call this a zero-sum interaction. Okay, so far so good. What we really want to focus on here, though, is altruism. And altruism, that scenario is switched. Okay, squirrel A, in a minor case of altruism, is now going to give his nut to squirrel B. Okay, squirrel A donates a nut to squirrel B, so he's worse off. It's a negative for him, but it's a positive for this other squirrel who now benefits by having a nut. Okay, so that would be a, a sort of a minor case of what we would call altruism. All right. So I want to talk a little bit more about the more significant cases of altruism, like altruism on a bigger scale. And so what Dawkins says is, with his selfish gene theory, is that organisms are motivated not always to act in their own best interest. Certainly they do that, but sometimes they act against their individual interests. And the reason for that, he says, is because of selfish genes what the individual organism, what the individual squirrel, presumably what the individual person is doing, is they're acting in the best interest of their genes, even if that's not always their own best interest. Let's go back to squirrels for a second. Now, a common predator of squirrels around here is an animal called the red-tailed hawk. And sometimes you'll even see, I've actually seen a red-tailed hawk on more than one occasion swoop down and uh, attack a squirrel and kill it and start eating it or fly away with it. So the red-tailed hawk is one of many predators that squirrels have. And so what's really common when squirrels live together in um, sort of the same neck of the woods, the same forest, uh, of course, they're very closely related, right? These squirrels, if you do a genetic analysis, they're very closely related to one another. And what the researchers found was that when a predator like a red-tailed hawk comes by, it's not unusual for an individual squirrel to climb a tree and start squawking like crazy, making all of this noise, flapping its tail around like crazy. Now, how does this make sense? Because from the level, from the perspective of the predator, that squirrel's an easy target now. That squirrel's not hiding. He's making himself very visible. He's, being, he's moving around. He's making all kinds of noise. That's going to be a real easy target for that red-tailed hawk to hone in on which is why often they'll get killed in the process. Okay, so what's wrong with this squirrel from the evolutionary perspective? Well, what they found is that when a squirrel is living near other squirrels that it's genetically close to, it's, relative, it's brothers and it's sisters and close cousins, it's very willing to make that self-sacrificial behavior. It'll uh, sound the alarm call, uh, presumably to help save the other squirrels. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, but if you take a squirrel, if you transplant it from area A to area B, and now this squirrel knows that he's not closely related to these other squirrels, it's much, much, much less likely to act in that behavior. Okay, so it's a fascinating explanation of why animals um, will act in self-sacrificial ways and why we're more willing to do this for our own family members than we are for people we're not related to, or especially people that we perceive as our enemies, right? We're not going to sacrifice for our enemies. And so one day we're sitting around in a semicircle in class, and I pose the question after we talk about all of this and I lecture on all this stuff, I said, okay, guys, small class, like 15, 20 people, I said, what would be the most altruistic act that a human being could perform? All right, didn't take long, a hand went up, and so I called on that student, and that student said, well, I think it would be self-sacrifice, like in wartime, you know, the soldier that jumps on the grenade to help protect uh, his buddies. That's a very sacrificial behavior, and in fact, that, of course, is. And I said, you know, I think you're on to something here. Um, I like your answer, but I don't think, and of course, that's a very high expression of altruism, but I think it can even be talked based upon the things we've been talking about. Okay, and so I said, keep thinking, guys, keep thinking, because this is a really cool point. And um, eventually another hand went up, 
and the student said, well, what about the instance in which a parent is willing to sacrifice his or her child, right, for, uh, to, to help or save someone else? And I said, I like the way you're thinking, you're on the right track. Because human beings, unlike squirrels, unlike most other animals, we're a very high parental investment, right? We're, we, we invest extraordinarily into our offspring, even more than other species do. And so I said, I like your answer, but keep going. I've got a follow-up question. I said, would that be a bigger sacrifice if a parent sacrificed uh, a child uh, if they had many children or if they only had one, ch one child, based upon everything we've been talking about? And of course, the students all said, well, if they only had one child, that would be a bigger sacrifice. I said, okay, so what we have so far is we have a parent um, sacrificing their child, who is their only child. I said, okay, last question. Would that be a bigger sacrifice if that sacrifice was made for their friends or for their enemies? And of course, the students said it would be more extraordinary, more remarkable if that sacrifice was made for uh, one's enemies. And so I said, okay, now let's put this together. We have a parent sacrificing his only child, right? He doesn't have more, just one child. And he does this for the benefit of not his friends, not his family, but for his enemies. Does that sound familiar to you? And then finally, and I, I was an atheist at the time, but I had some Christian students in the class and one of the young ladies said, that sounds to me like what Christians call the gospel. And I said, you're right, bingo, bingo, you're right. I said, this is, this is what Christians call the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, the relevant Bible verse there is Romans 5 verse 8, which says that God demonstrates his love. God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still his enemies, right? Not while we were his friends, while we were still his enemies, he sent Christ to die for us. And so here it is. This is remarkable to me. My, my, my explanation at the time was, well, this explains why Christian, Christianity is so popular, why it resonates on such a profound and deep level with the human psyche, because what it somehow worked its way into was uh, the most powerful, the most compelling, the most sacrificial act of love or selflessness that could conceivably be expressed by one individual towards another. Of course, you know, later on, within a year or so, um, I was challenged to look deeper into uh, the story of Jesus. I don't even like to call it the story, but the historical accounts of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did my research, I did my homework, I came to the point where I could no longer deny that he was a real person, that he lived on this earth, that he died on a cross, that by all accounts of those closest to him, he rose again on the third day. He appeared to over 500 eyewitnesses. And the Bible says he ever lives to make intercession to any who would come to God or approach God through him. So just what a wonderful picture, right? We go from Richard Dawkins. <laughs> we use evolutionary theory. We appeal to a theory by the world's leading atheistic evolutionist. And it takes us right to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I just thought that's fascinating, and I thought it was worth sharing with you. So God bless you.